section fifty seven of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen the golden gems of life by emory adams allen and s c ferguson section fifty seven politeness among the qualities of mind and heart which conduce to worldly success there is no one the importance of which is more real yet which is more generally underrated at this day by the young than courtesy that feeling of kindness of love for our fellows which expresses itself in pleasing manners owing to that spirit of self-reliance and self-assertion they are too apt to despise those nameless and exquisite tendernesses of thought and manner that mark the true gentleman yet history is crowded with examples showing that as in literature it is the delicate indefinable charm of style not the thought that makes a work immortal so it is the bearing of a man towards his fellows that oft-times more than any other circumstance promotes or obstructs his advancement in life manner has a great deal to do with the estimation in which men are held by the world and it has often more influence in the government of others than qualities of much greater depth and substance we may complain that our fellow-men are more for form than substance for the superficial rather than the solid contents of a man but the fact remains and it is a clue to many of the seeming anomalies and freaks of fortune which surprise us in the matter of worldly prosperity the success or failure of one's plans have often turned upon the address and manner of the man though there are a few people who can look beyond the rough husk or shell of a fellow-being to the finer qualities hidden within yet the vast majority not so keen visaged nor tolerant judge a person by his outward bearings and conduct grace agreeable manners and fascinating powers are one thing while politeness is another the two points are often mistaken in the occasional meeting but the true gentleman always rises to the surface at last nothing will develop a spirit of true politeness except a mind imbued with goodness justice and generosity manners are different in every country but true politeness is everywhere the same manners which take up so much of our attention are only artificial helps which ignorance assumes in order to imitate politeness which is the result of much good sense some good nature and a little self-denial for the sake of others but with no design of obtaining the same indulgence from them a person possessed of those qualities though he had never seen a court is truly agreeable and if without them would continue a clown though he had been all his life a gentleman usher he is truly well bred who knows when to value and when to despise those national peculiarities which are regarded by some with so much observance a traveller of taste at once perceives that the wise are polite all the world over but that fools are polite only at home since circumstances always alter cases the polite man must know when to violate the conventional forms which common practice has established and when to respect them to be a slave to any set code of actions is as bad as to despise them perceptiveness adaptation penetration and a happy faculty of suiting manners to circumstances is one of the principles upon which one must work for the etiquette of the drawing-room differs from that of the office or railroad car and what may be downright rudeness in one case may be gentility in the other benevolence and charity with a true spirit of meekness must be one of the ruling motives of the understanding for without this no man can be polite politeness must know no classification the rich and the poor must alike share its justice and humanity exclusive spirits that shun those whose level in life is not on the same extravagant platform as themselves cannot aspire to the high honour of wearing the name of gentleman 
the truly polite man acts from the highest and noblest ideas of what is right true politeness ever hath regard for the comfort and happiness of others it is says witherspoon real kindness kindly expressed viewed in this light how devoid of the virtue are some who pride themselves on a strict observance of all its rules many a man who now stands ranked as a gentle man because his smile is ready and his bow exquisite is in reality unworthy of such an honour since he cares more for the least incident pertaining to his own comfort than he does for the greatest occasion of discomfort to others the true gentleman is recognized by his regard for the rights and feelings of others even in matters the most trivial he respects the individuality of others just as he wishes others to respect his own in society he is quiet easy unobtrusive putting on no airs nor hinting by word or manner that he deems himself better wiser or richer than any one about him he is never stuck up nor looks down upon others because they have not titles honours or social position equal to his own he never boasts of his achievements or angles for compliments by affecting to underrate what he has done he prefers to act rather than to talk to be rather than to seem and above all things is distinguished by his deep insight and sympathy his quick perception of and attention to those little and apparently insignificant things that may cause pleasure or pain to others in giving his opinions as he does not dogmatize he listens patiently and respectfully to other men and if compelled to dissent from their opinions acknowledges his fallibility and asserts his own views in such a manner as to command the respect of all who hear him frankness and cordiality mark all his intercourse with his fellows and however high his station the humblest man feels instantly at ease in his presence the truest politeness comes of sincerity it must be the outcome of the heart or it will make no lasting impression for no amount of polish will dispense with truthfulness the natural character must be allowed to appear free of its angularities and asperities to acquire that ease and grace of manners which distinguishes and is possessed by every well-bred person one must think of others rather than of one's self and study to please them even at one's own inconvenience do unto others as you would that others should do unto you the golden rule of life is also the law of politeness and such politeness implies self-sacrifice many struggles and conflicts it is an art and tact rather than an instinct and inspiration daily experience shows that civility is not only one of the essentials of success but it is almost a fortune in itself and that he who has this quality in perfection though a blockhead is almost sure to rise where without it men of high ability fail give a boy address and accomplishment says emerson and you give him the mastery of palaces and fortunes wherever he goes he has not the trouble of earning or owning them they solicit him to enter and possess genuine politeness is almost as necessary to enjoyable success as integrity or industry we despise servility but true and uniform politeness is the glory of any young man it should be a politeness full of frankness and good nature unobtrusive constant and uniform in its exhibition to every class of men he who is overwhelmingly polite to a celebrity or a nabob and rude to a laborer because he is a laborer deserves to be despised that style of manners which combines self-respect with respect for the rights and feelings of others especially if it be warmed up by the fires of a genial heart is a thing to be coveted and cultivated and it is a thing that pays alike in cash and comfort what a man says or does is often an uncertain test of what he is it is the way in which he says or does it that furnishes the best index of his character 
it is by the incidental expression given to his thoughts and feelings by his looks tones and gestures rather than by his deeds and words that we prefer to judge him one may do certain deeds from design or repeat certain professions by rote honeyed words may mask feelings of hate and kindly acts may be formed expressly to veil sinister ends but the manner of the man is not so easily controlled the mode in which a kindness is done often affects us more than the deed itself the act may have been prompted by one of many questionable motives as vanity pride or interests but the warmth or coldness of address is less likely to deceive a favour may be conferred so grudgingly as to prevent any feeling of obligation or it may be refused so courteously as to awaken more kindly feelings than if it had been ungraciously granted good manners are well nigh an essential part of life education and their importance cannot be too largely magnified when we consider that they are the outward expressions of an inward virtue social courtesies should emanate from the heart for remember always that the worth of manner consists in being the sincere expression of feelings like the dial of a watch they should indicate that the works within are good and true true civility needs no false lights to show its points it is the embodiment of truth the mere opening out of the inner self the arts and artifices of a polished exterior are well enough but if they are anything more or less than a fair exponent of inward rectitude their hollowness cannot long escape detection the cultivation of manner though in excess it is foppish and foolish is highly necessary in a person who has occasion to negotiate with others in matters of business affability and good breeding may even be regarded as essential to the success of a man in any eminent station and in large sphere of life for the want of it has not unfrequently been found in a great measure to neutralize the results of much industry integrity and honesty of character there are no doubt a few strong tolerant minds which can bear with defects and angularities of manner and look only to the more genuine qualities but the world at large is not so forbearant and cannot help forming its judgments and likings mainly according to outward conduct it has been well remarked that whoever imagines legitimate manners can be taken up and laid aside put on and off for the moment has missed their deepest law a noble and attractive everyday bearing comes of goodness of sincerity of refinement and these are bred in years not moments it is the fruit of years of earnest kindly endeavors to please it is the last touch the crowning perfection of a noble character it has been truly described as the gold on the spire the sunlight on the cornfield and results only from the truest balance and harmony of soul end of section fifty seven section fifty eight of the golden gems of life this is a labor box recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen the golden gems of life by emory adams allen and s c ferguson section fifty eight sociability society has been a fly compared to a heap of embers which when separated soon languish darken and expire but if placed together glow with a ruddy and intense heat a just emblem of the strength happiness and security derived from society the savage who never knew the blessings of combination and he who quits society from apathy or misanthropic spleen are like the separate embers dark dead useless they neither give nor receive heat neither love nor are beloved from social intercourse are derived some of the highest enjoyments of life where there is a free interchange of opinion the mind acquires new ideas and by a frequent exercise of its powers the understanding gains fresh vigor 
the true sphere of human virtue is found in society this is the school of human faith and trials in social active life difficulties will perpetually be met with restraints of many kinds will be necessary and studying to behave right in respect to these is a discipline of the human heart useful to others and improving to itself it is good to meet in friendly intercourse and pour out that social cheer which so vivifies the weary and desponding heart it elevates the feelings and makes us all the better for the world society is the balm of life should any one be entirely excluded from all human intercourse he would be wretched men are formed for society it is one important end for which they were made rational creatures no man was made solely for himself and no man is capable of living in the world totally independent of others the wants and weaknesses of mankind render society necessary for their convenience safety and support god has formed men with different powers and faculties and placed them under different circumstances that they might be able to promote each other's good some are wiser richer and stronger than others that they may direct the conduct supply the wants and bear the burdens of others some are formed for one and some are formed for another employment and all are qualified for some useful business conducive to the general good of society the whole frame and texture of mankind make it appear that they were designed to live in society the longer men live in society the more terrible is the thought of being excluded from it society is the only field where the sexes meet on the terms of equality the arena where character is formed and studied the cradle in the realm of public opinion the crucible of ideas the world's university at once a school and a theatre the spur and the crown of ambition the tribunal which unmasks pretensions and stamps real merit the power that gives government leave to be and outruns the church in fixing the moral sense of the people many young men fail for years to get hold of the idea that they are subject to social duties they act as though the social machinery of the world were self-operating they see around them social organizations in active existence the parish the church and other bodies that embrace in some form of society all men are successfully operated and yet they take no part nor lot in the matter they do not think it necessary for them to devote either time or money to society sometimes they are apt to get into a morbid state of mind which disinclines them to social intercourse they become so devoted to business that all social intercourse is irksome they go out to tea as if they were going to jail and drag themselves to a party as to an execution this disposition is thoroughly selfish and is to be overcome by going where you are invited always and at any sacrifice of mere feeling do not shrink from contact with any thing except bad morals men who affect your unhealthy mind with antipathy will prove themselves very frequently on mature acquaintance your best friends and wisest counsellors it is to be noticed with what apparent ease some men enter society and how others remain away always such are apt to think that society has not discharged its duties as to them but all social duties are reciprocal society is far more apt to pay its dues to the individual than the individual to society have you who complain of the cold selfishness of society done anything to give you a claim to social recognition what kind of coin do you propose to pay in the discharge of the obligations which come upon you with social recognition in other words as a return for what you wish society to do what will you do for society will you be a member of society by right or by courtesy if you have so mean a spirit as to be content to be a beneficiary of society to receive favors and confer none you have no business in the social circle to which you aspire the spirit of life is society that of society is freedom that of freedom the discreet and modest use of it a man may contemplate virtue in solitude and retirement but the practical part consists in its participation and the society it hath with others for whatever is good is better for being communicated as too long a retirement weakens the mind so too much company dissipates it too much society is nearly as bad as none a man secluded from company can have none but the devil and himself to tempt him 
but he that converses much in the world has almost as many snares as he has companions the great object of society is refreshment of spirit this is not to be obtained by luxury or by the cankerous habit of speaking against others but by a bright and easy interchange of ideas on subjects which even in their brightest and most playful aspects are worthy to engage the thoughts of men there is an essential vulgarity in one phase of social life that which considers the welfare of the guest's stomach to be the essential part of the host's duty and the great question of the guests to relate to the decorating of their own backs such views elevate nobody they refine nobody they inspire and instruct nobody they satisfy nobody this view loses sight of the great end and aim of society which is to refine and elevate mankind not to feed them upon dainties or to enable them to show off good clothes dean swift had a better relish for good society than for choice viands when invited to the houses of great men he sometimes insisted upon knowing what persons he was likely to meet i don't want your bill of fare but your bill of company it is this losing sight of the true end of society which causes it to present so many strange anomalies yet with all its defects it is well nigh indispensable to one who would wield power and influence in the world's arena there is no way to act out the promptings of your better nature and to move men in the right direction so potential as that offered to the social man you cannot move men until you show yourself one among them you cannot know their wants and needs until you have mingled with them by refusing to cast your lot with others socially you are as powerless to do good as the mountain peak is to raise tropical flowers it is the manner of some to forego meeting others socially there will certainly come a time when they will regret it for the human heart is like a millstone in a mill when you put wheat under it it turns and bruises the wheat into flour if you put no wheat in it it still grinds on but then it grinds away itself in society the sorrows and griefs of others are the object from which we extract the flower of charity and loving-kindness but to the hermit from society his own griefs and sorrows have the effect to render him cold and selfish man in society is like a flower-bud on its native stalk it is there alone his faculties expanded in full bloom shine out their only reach their proper use it is not safe for man to be alone in the midst of the loudest vauntings of philosophy nature will have her yearning for society and friendship a good heart wants something to be kind to and the best part of our nature suffers most when deprived of congenial society it becomes all men to seek the general good of society in return for the benefits they receive from it though the general good of society sometimes requires the individual members to give up private good for that of the public yet it is always to be supposed that individuals receive more advantage than disadvantage from society on the whole indeed there is scarcely any comparison in this case the public blessings are always immensely great and numerous they are more in number than can be reckoned up and greater in worth than can be easily described the most independent individuals in society owe their principal independence to society and the most retired and inactive persons feel the happy influence of society though they may seem to be detached from it no man can reflect upon that constant stream of good which is perpetually flowing down to him from well-regulated society without feeling his obligation to maintain and support it should this stream of happiness cease to flow the most careless and indifferent would feel their loss and feel a sense of their duty to uphold the good of society let the head of society cease to direct and the hands to execute and the other members of the public body would soon find themselves in a forlorn and wretched state End of section fifty eight section fifty nine of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen the golden gems of life by emory adams allen and s c ferguson section fifty nine dignity the dignity of man into your hands is given o oh, keep it well with you it sinks or lifts itself to heaven schiller 
dignity denotes that propriety of mien and carriage which is appropriate to the different walks and ranks of life in regard to our intercourse with men we should often reflect not only whether our conduct is proper and correct but whether it is urbane and dignified dignity of carriage is nearly always associated with high endowments the reverse is at any rate true that high endowments are associated with dignity a trifling air and manner bespeaks a thoughtless and silly mind saith the chinese proverb but a grave and majestic outside is as it were the palace of the soul true dignity is never gained by place and never lost when honors are withdrawn there may be dignity in a hovel as well as in a court in one who depends on the sweat of his brow as well as one who is placed by reason of his wealth in a position of independence in all ranks and classes it is equally acceptable and worthy of esteem true dignity is without arms it does not deal in vain and ostentatious parade in proportion as we gratify our own self-esteem by a love of display we commonly forfeit to the same degree the respect of those whose good opinion is worth possessing a dignified manner is not necessarily an imposing manner for true dignity is but the outward expression of inherent worth of character but an imposing manner is generally ostentatious in degree and as such may be taken as an evidence of imposition that dignity which seeks to make an ostentatious display is often only a veil between us and the real truth of things it is only the false mask of appearance put on to conceal inherent defects the ennobling quality of all politeness is dignity have you not noticed that there are some persons who possess an inexpressible charm of manner a something which attracts our love instantaneously when they have neither wealth position nor talents you will find that a dignity of manner characterizes their actions and that a spirit of dignity hovers around them on the other hand have you not seen persons of wealth who were surrounded by luxury and all the comforts of affluence yet in lacking a spirit of dignity lacked the essential to render their lives influential for good where there is an inherent want of dignity in the character how many distinguished and even noble acquisitions are required to supply its place but when a natural dignity of character exists what a prepossession does it enlist in its favor and with how few substantial and real excellencies are we able to pass credibility through the world there are three kinds of dignity which either adorn or deface human character there is the dignity of etiquette and good manners which is often of an artificial kind and is a creature of rules and ceremonies and not of the heart the second is the dignity of pride and arrogance this is a presumptuous dignity arising from self-conceit and egotism it is thoroughly selfish in its nature it is more a spirit of haughtiness and cold reserve than of true dignity then there is the dignity of compassion and kindness this is that true dignity which ennobles life it arises not from selfishness but from kindness of heart and from a sense of the importance of life some men find it almost impossible to discover the line which separates dignity from conceit dignity is a splendid personal quality if it be of the right sort to possess it is to be above meanness above cringing above anything that is low and unseemly it holds up its head even among poverty and outward shabbiness and looks the world bravely in the face it is innate manliness that outward garb cannot change but conceit is a very different quality and its possessor is very far from being dignified though he doubtlessly considers himself to be so he looks upon himself as the grand centre of his social system and upon all others as satellites whose particular business is to revolve around him the assumption may not take shape in words but it comes out in his manner all the same let him undertake to be amiable and there is a sort of royal condescension he takes the attitude of stooping rather than that of one reaching out friendly hands to his equals all this would be offensive and somewhat exasperating were it not ridiculous but we laugh in charitable good nature and pity his absurdities there is little use in trying to point them out to him 
he is so hoodwinked by his overshadowing self-esteem that he cannot see true dignity does not consist in haughty self-assurance in resolving to be dignified let us see to it that we strive for the true kind in counselling dignity we advise no spirit of cold hauteur and pride but we do counsel such outward walk and conversations as shall become one who has a just appreciation of life and its possibilities one who is always given to light and flippant remarks and always assuming a free and easy style in his demeanour cannot carry such an impression of power as one who bears about him the impression of a man among men by his dignified and decorous bearing true dignity exists independent of studied gestures or well-practised smiles its seat should be in the mind and then it will not be found wanting in the manner it is often strikingly and eloquently displayed in the bearings of those utterly unacquainted with the strict rules of etiquette if one has a modest consciousness of his own worth and a sincere desire to be of worth to others he must necessarily display true dignity in his manner and bearing towards others End of section fifty nine section sixty of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen the golden gems of life by emory adams allen and s c ferguson section sixty affability affability is a real ornament the most beautiful dress that man or woman can wear and worth far more as a means of winning favor than the finest clothes and jewels ever were the exercise of affability creates an instantaneous impression in your behalf while the opposite quality excites as quick a prejudice against you so true is this that were we asked to name any one quality which aside from mere mental powers contributed largely to success we would mention affability apart from its worth as an agreeable trait of character affability is a valuable commodity every one who has business to transact should add this to his stock and trade it costs nothing while it vastly facilitates trade and profit there are business men and women who make fortunes simply by their affable and polite manners their wares or their services are no better perhaps than the stock in trade of their crusty neighbors but having undertaken a business or adopted a profession they are wise enough to know that whatever is to be done successfully must be done in a pleasing manner and with a good will their acts appear to be based on the conviction that everybody may be made a friend which is every way preferable to acting as if everybody were an intruder they do not treat people as though they were in a hurry to be done with them but as though they might be cultivated into an acquaintance and grow into a friend to neglect the small courtesies of life is to ensure neglect for yourself and the reason that some persons are successful where others fail is that they invite strangers to become friends by civility while the others repel even friends by the want of courtesy the world at best is extremely selfish we are too much taken up with our own personal aims to notice how others are thriving we little think how others may be wishing for some friendly recognition how far with them the friendly shake of the hand may go the world is full of suffering and sorrow and it is at these seasons that kindly words come with far more than their usual force the human heart was formed for sympathy as naturally as the flower for sunshine hence it is no wonder that the man of affable and kind manners should be the one who would make friends wherever he goes it is good to meet in friendly intercourse and pour out that social cheer which so vivifies the weary and desponding heart give to all the hearty grasp and sunny smile they send sunshine to the soul and make the heart leap as with new life and joy thus may we become brothers in every good word and deed and peace and good will spread in the world we long for friendly intercourse and when deprived of the society of others we pine and grow sick at heart we become misanthropic and gloomy the summer of the heart changes to dreary winter 
and our lives seem overcast and gloomy we are not well enough acquainted each with each and all with all we are not social enough we are not found often enough at one another's houses we are especially delinquent in the duty of calling upon such as come among us and connect themselves with us we do not welcome them and seek to make their stay as pleasant as possible we do not take the kindly notice we should of such as come to our places of public and social gatherings this is wrong it is incumbent on us as members of society to cultivate a spirit of affability to strive to make all within our influence happy by our kind solicitude for their welfare says daniel webster we should make it a principle to extend the hand of fellowship to every man who discharges faithfully his duties and maintains good order who manifests a deep interest in the general welfare of society whose deportment is upright and whose mind is intelligent without stopping to ascertain whether he swings a hammer or draws a thread as there is nothing to be lost and so much to be gained by the exercise of affability it is deeply to be regretted that so few use it to be affable does not imply an indiscriminate taking into confidence and imparting to third persons the secrets of your business at the same time expecting to be informed of his to do thus is merely simplicity and is an utter disregard of all cautious rules but the friendly conversation the hearty grasp of the hand the feeling of kindness and good will which finds expression in the tones the willingness to do a favor cheerfully these constitute true affability which is not only of value to the possessor but may almost claim a place among the christian graces how many there are who are not in want of assistance of material things but who are yearning for social recognition who feel themselves shut out from intercourse with their fellow-beings by the spirit of selfishness which shows itself in a refusal of social privileges it is so easy to become thoughtless in this matter that each one should strive against the feeling and should constantly strive to make all around him feel that he recognizes in them the man or woman an equal being with himself and to meet them with kindness by no means devoid of dignity but to let them see that he is moved by a spirit of good will towards all and desires as far as possible to do away with the distinction of rank or wealth and to meet with them on the plane of equality in urging affability we do not ignore the fact that there are many to be found in every walk of life with whom the less one has to do the better that you would as soon think of taking a serpent into the bosom of your family as some people who infest society but this lamentable fact does not lessen the claims of affability since because you are fond of fruit you are not required to eat indiscriminately all kinds of fruits the good and also the bad the nutritious as well as the poisonous but you are to exercise a judicious elimination so you are not required to be frank open-hearted and sociable with villains and blacklegs the depraved and licentious to do this is to sink yourself to their level but a man may be a gentle man and as such entitled to recognition though his coat be not of broadcloth or of the most fashionable make and a real lady though clad in calico is as worthy of frank and courteous treatment as though robed in silk and satins end of section sixty section sixty one of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by annie hill the gems of life by emory adams allen and s c ferguson section sixty one the toilet quote costly thy habit as thy purse can buy but not expressed in fancy rich not gaudy for the apparel oft proclaims the man shakespeare End quote. as the index tells us the contents of books and directs to the particular chapter even so does the outward habit and superficial order of garment denote the spirit and demonstratively point out like to a marginal note the internal qualities of the soul 
we believe it to be the duty of all young and old to make their persons as far as possible agreeable to those with whom they are associated if possible dress yourself fine where others are fine and plain where the apparel of others is plain a man who finds himself badly dressed amongst well-dressed people feels awkward and ill at ease he stammers and is confused in speech he makes all manner of ridiculous blunders and it is well nigh impossible for him to assume that air of simple dignity which should characterize the bearing of a gentleman but it should be remembered that this feeling should have nothing to do with dress proper it is only when there is a manifest impropriety in the mode of dress the dress should suit the time and the occasion the man in his workshop or field or the lady busied with the household duties should have no occasion to feel ill at ease because not so finely dressed as the casual caller such a feeling should be instantly checked since it is born of pride not of an innate desire to please others the love of beauty and refinement belongs to every true woman she ought to desire in moderation pretty dresses and delight in beautiful colors and graceful fabrics she ought to take a certain not too expensive pride in herself and be solicitous to have all belongings to her well chosen and in good style many fail to understand the true object and importance of this sentiment let no woman suppose that any man much less her husband is indifferent to her appearance but women should constantly beware lest what was meant as a means of influence becomes a ruling passion and let it be ever remembered that beauty of dress does not reside in the material that time place and circumstance are all to be considered that they may look far more bewitching in the eyes of those whom they are desirous to please when clad in neat calico than if robed in silks and satins and depend upon it that the husband wearied with his day's work had far rather find the wife neatly clad doing or superintending household duties than when dressed in the height of fashion she greets him to a home that sadly needs an efficient willing housekeeper through dress the mind may be read as through the delicate tissue the lettered page women are more like flowers than we think in their dress and adornments they express their natures as the flowers in their petals and colors some women are like the modest daisies and violets they never look or feel better than when dressed in a morning wrapper when women are free to dress as they like uncontrolled by others and not limited by their circumstances they do not fail to express their true characters a modest woman will dress modestly a really refined and intelligent woman will bear the marks of careful selection and faultless taste it is to be feared that many both ladies and gentlemen fail to recognize the beauty which always accompanies simplicity the stern simplicity of the classic taste is seen in the statues and pictures of the old masters in athens the ladies were not gaudily but simply arrayed and we doubt whether any ladies have ever excited more admiration female loveliness never appears so good advantage as when set off by simplicity of dress tinselries may serve to give effect on the stage or upon the ballroom floor but in daily life there is no substitute for the charm of simplicity a vulgar taste is not to be disguised by gold and diamonds the absence of a true taste and refinement of delicacy cannot be compensated by the possession of the most princely trousseau mind measures gold but gold cannot measure mind those who think that in order to dress well it is necessary to dress extravagantly or gaudily make a great mistake elegance of dress does not depend upon expense a lady might wear the costliest silks that italy could produce adorn herself with laces from brussels which years of patient toil are required to fabricate she might carry the jewels of an eastern princess around her neck and upon her wrists and fingers yet still in appearance be essentially vulgar these are nothing without grace without adaptation without an harmonious development of colors without the exercise of discrimination and good taste god has implanted in the minds of all but especially in the female breast the love of beauty 
and one way that this feeling finds expression is in the matter of dress and personal adornment we think that it is the duty of all to clothe themselves in that style of dress which most becomes them provided that it does not conflict with hygienic rules and is warranted by their circumstances it is their duty since when in choice personal adornment they have a dignity and sense of personal elevation which they do not experience when in uncouth attire pride of course often enters into fine dressing and many women are fond of flaunting their fine feathers in people's eyes but a great majority love handsome dressing in obedience to an instinct of refinement in consequence of that sense of personal purity which accompanies the wearing of choice apparel to advise a young lady to dress herself with any serious departure from the prevailing fashion of her day and class is to advise her to incur a penalty which may very probably be the wreck of her whole life's happiness but it is only the fault of public opinion that any penalties at all follow innovations in themselves sensible and modest to train this public opinion by degrees to bear with more variations of costume and especially to insist upon the principle of fitness as the first requisite of beauty should be the aim of all sensible women nothing can be in worse taste than for sensible women to wear clothes by which their natural movements are impeded and their purposes of whatever sort thwarted by their habiliments the styles of dress are so many and varied that it would be a vain as well as useless attempt to classify them there is one principle running through all which every woman should carefully consider are your modes of dress in accordance with the rules of hygiene this question you ought carefully to consider ever remembering that nature will allow none of her laws to be violated in the name of fashion with impunity and that every style of dress that does not conform to the plainest of nature's teaching should be frowned down upon by all sensible people dress to be in perfect taste need not be costly it is to be regretted that in this age too much attention is paid to dress by those who have neither the excuse of ample means nor of social culture the wife of a poorly paid clerk or of a young man just starting in business aims at dressing as stylishly as does the wealthiest among her acquaintances consistency in regard to station and fortune is the first matter to be considered a woman of good sense will not wish to expend in unnecessary extravagance money wrung from an anxious husband or if her husband be a man of fortune she will not even encroach upon her allowance in the early years of married life when the income is moderate it should be the pride of a woman to see how little she can spend upon her dress and yet present that tasteful and creditable appearance which is desirable the dress of a gentleman never appears more credible than when characterized by simplicity a gentleman's taste in dress is shown in the avoidance of all extravagance a man of wit may sometimes be a coxcomb but a man of judgment and sense never can be a bow dressed out is like a cinnamon tree the bark is worth more than the body a dandy is said to be the mercer's friend the tailor's fool and his own foe there are a thousand fops made by art for one fool made by nature to judge from the actions of many of our young men one would suppose that dress was their highest aim in life elegance of attire is indeed well and when suitable to the surroundings bespeaks the gentleman but men of sterling worth and character are apt to have a feeling of contempt for the one who by his faultless attire and spruce manner conclusively shows that he is actuated by a dandy's view of life a coat that has the mark of use upon it is a recommendation to people of sense and a hat with too much nap or too high a luster a derogatory circumstance the best coats in our streets are worn on the backs of penniless fops broken-down merchants clerks with pitiful salaries and men that do not pay up dandies and fops are like a body without a soul powder without ball lightning without thunderbolt paint on sand there is much of this in the world 
we see it exemplified in everything considered valuable. The counterfeiter gives the show of gold to his base coin, and the show of value to his lying banknote. The thief hangs out the appearance of honesty in his face, and the liar is thunderstruck if anybody suspects him of equivocation. The bankrupt carries about with him the appearance of wealth. The fop puts on the masquerade of dignity and importance. The poor belle, whose mother washes to buy her plumes, outshines the peeress of the court. Many a table steams with costly viands for which the last cent was paid, and many a coat, sleek and black, is worn on the street on which the tailor has a moral mortgage. In the matter of dress, then, when we sum it all up, we find that the love of dress is inherent in all true men and women, and that it would be as unwise as it would be useless to strive against it, that while no man or woman should allow themselves to become a slave to dress and fashion, still it is no less a duty than it is a privilege to cultivate this love of adornment, ever keeping it within due bounds, remembering that outward adornment should be but secondary to the adornment of the soul with all noble and great qualities. End of section 61. The Toilet. Section 62 of The Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. The Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson. Section 62. Gentleness. We may admire proofs of hardiness and assurance, but we involuntarily attach ourselves to simplicity and gentleness. Gentleness is like the silent influence of light which gives color to all nature. It is far more powerful than loudness or force, and far more beautiful. It pushes its way silently and persistently like the tiniest daffodil in spring, which raises the clod and thrusts it aside by the simple persistence of growing. It tends to be feared that in this stirring age, when we enumerate the elements of success, that we do not lay stress enough on the milder virtues of simplicity and gentleness, while fond of applauding the hardier virtues of energy, self-reliance, perseverance, and others of a similar nature, we are in danger of losing sight of the fact that oft-times an exhibition of gentleness and courtesy is not only extremely pleasing in itself, but is not infrequently one of the most expeditious and efficacious modes of advancing present interests. It is singular what power gentleness and courtesy bestows on him who practices them. The most boisterous winds only cause the traveller to wrap his cloak the closer to him, while the gentle rays of the sun speedily induce him to discard it. And thus it is with many of the pursuits of life, where sheer force of intellect or intensity of application would oft-times end only in a failure of plans and purposes. Gentleness, by its silent but powerful influence, will not only excite a feeling of good will in the minds of others, but as oil removes friction from a machine and causes it to move smoothly, so will gentleness remove apparently insurmountable objects from the pathway of our success. Gentleness belongs to virtue, and is to be carefully distinguished from the spirit of cowardice or the fawning a sense of sycophants. It removes no just right from fear. It gives no important truth to flattery. It is indeed not only consistent with a firm mind, but it necessarily requires a manly spirit and a fixed principle in order to give it any real value. An able man shows his spirit by gentle words but resolute actions. How often experience convinces us that a bold and brazen loudness of tones and roughness of manner cover only a vacillating spirit and irresolute actions. On the other hand, do not history and observation show that quietness and gentleness 
oft-times mark the most determined of actions the rarest bravery of all the world is found actively engaged accompanied by an exhibition of gentleness and ought we not so to expect it the person moved by a spirit of gentleness throws all the energy of his nature into action it is not allowed to waste in boisterousness but is guided and directed in the most appropriate channels by an understanding calm and collected in the captain of a canal boat we generally expect gruffness of manner loudness of tones and a general lack of refinement dignity and gentleness but in the commander of an ocean steamer we shall always find the quietness gentleness and dignity that we all recognize as such a proper accompaniment of power so true it is that gentleness of manner is the most appropriate and general expression of true greatness and worth that we use the expression a gentleman to express the highest type of worth in man in the mechanical world do we not always find that the greater the exhibition of power the steadier and quieter the movement becomes it is the rickety engine of but few horsepowers that goes with a fizz and a clatter while the massive engine that supplies the motive power for acres of machinery goes almost noiselessly and the sublimest exhibition of power in the universe the movement of the heavenly bodies proceeds in absolute quiet we observe the same effect in the moral world the masterminds who have moved kingdoms and swayed the thoughts of millions are uniformly gentle and dignified in their bearings the loud tongue and clatter-brained fanatics merely cause a movement in their immediate vicinity there is a magic power in gentle words the potency of which but few natures are so icy as to wholly resist would you have your home a cheerful hallowed spot within which may be found that happiness and peace which the world denies to its votaries let not loud harsh words be uttered within its walls let only gentle quiet actions there be found speak gently to the wearied husband who with anxious brow returns from the perplexities of his daily avocations and let him in his turn speak gently to the careworn woman and wife who amid her never-ending round of little duties finds rest and encouragement in the sympathy of him she loves speak gently to the wayward child a pleasant smile and a word of kindness will often restore good humour and playfulness human nature is the same with it it has its joys and sorrows as well as those of mature growth and its little heart will quickly yield to the power of gentle loving kindness hearts of children are after all much like flowers they remain open to the softly falling dew but shut up in the violent downfalls of rain therefore when you have occasions to rebuke children be careful to do it with manifest kindness and gentleness the effect will be incalculably better speak gently to the dependent who lightens your daily toil kind words ensure respect and affection while the angry rebuke provokes impertinence and dislike speak gently to the aged ones many are the trials through which they have passed and now in a little while they will be missed from their accustomed places the spirit will have passed to its rest the remembrance of an unkind word will then bring with it a bitter sting speak gently to the erring one are we not all weak and liable to err temptation of which we cannot judge may have surrounded him harshness will drive him on the sinful way gentleness may win him back to virtue true gentleness is founded on a sense of what we owe to him who made us and to the common nature of which we all share it arises from reflection on our own failings and wants and from just views of the condition and duty of man it is native feelings heightened and improved by principle it is not deficient in a sense of true worth and dignity but it recognizes in all men the possessors of infinite possibilities even the possibilities of eternal life and it treats them as brethren it summons to its highest and best form of expression all that is noble in manhood inspiring in purpose 
grand in aim, and walks proudly therein, humbly, yet with an air of conscious dignity, quietly, yet with the insignia of power. Since, then, true gentleness is thus significant of power, thus potential for good, and is the high and distinctive test of a gentleman, ought not all the young earnestly strive to learn that spirit of self-control, and accustom themselves to speak and act gently at all times, and by so doing to act as becomes a man and responsible being? End of section 62 Gentleness Section 63 of The Golden Gems of Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill The Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson Section 63 Modesty it has been remarked that the modest department of really wise men, when contrasted to the assuming air of the vain and ignorant, may be compared to the difference of wheat, which, while its ear is empty, holds up its head proudly, but as soon as it is filled with grain, bends modestly down and withdraws from observation. Thus, with true worth and merit, it is uniformly modest in deportment. It is only the shallow-pated who strive to attract attention by pretentious claims. The ocean depths are mute. It is only along shallow shores that the roar of the breakers is heard. It is not difficult to draw the line between self-reliance and modesty on the one hand, and self-esteem and arrogant pretensions on the other. True self-reliance does not call on all men to witness its exploits. It displays itself in action. It may be reserved in deportment, but quietly and modestly proceeds in the path that wisdom points out, with a steady reliance on its own powers. Not so self-esteem. Its boast is that it is sufficient for all things, which, to be sure, were not so bad were it not for the fact that when put to the test by necessity, it so quickly abandons its pretentious claims and forgetting to use its own powers, is anxious only for the aid of others. Modesty is a beautiful setting to the diamond of talents and genius. The mark of the truly successful man is absence of pretensions. He talks only in ordinary business style, avoids all brag, dresses plainly, promises not at all, performs much, speaks monosyllables, hugs his fact. He calls his employment by its lowest name, and so takes from evil tongues their sharpest weapon. Who made more wide and sweeping discoveries, of more far-reaching consequences than Newton? Yet listen to his modest confession. I know not what the world may think of my labors, but to myself it seems as though I had been but a child playing on the seashore, now finding some pebble rather more polished, and now some shell rather more agreeably variegated than another, while the immense ocean of truth extended itself unexplored before me. Thus it is always found that modesty accompanies great merit, and it has even been said that merit without modesty is generally insolent in expression. The greatest events in the world's history dawn with no more noise than the morning star makes in rising. All great developments complete themselves in the world, and modestly wait in silence, praising themselves never, and announcing themselves not at all. If honesty be the best policy, we cannot deny that modesty, as a matter of policy even, hath a rare virtue, what so quickly commands our good wishes, as modesty struggling under discouragement. What are sympathy, more than modesty struck down by affliction? Or what are respect and love, more than modesty ministering to the distresses of others? There is no surer passport to the favors of others than modesty of deportment. It will succeed where all else has failed to waken in the minds of others an interest in our affairs. It is to merit as shades to figures in a picture, giving it strength and beauty. Modesty is not bashfulness, though the two are often confounded. The bashfulness of timidity is constitutional, 
the bashfulness of credulity is pitiable the bashfulness of ignorance is disreputable but the bashfulness allied to modesty is a charm there are two distinct sorts of bashfulness the one is awkwardness joined to pride which on a further acquaintance with the world will be converted into the pertness of a coxcomb the other is closely allied to modesty it is a painful consciousness of self which is produced by our most delicate feelings and which the most extensive knowledge cannot always remove in undermining and removing bashfulness due regard is to be had to the adjacent modesty good nature and humanity as those who pull down private houses adjoining imposing buildings are careful to prop up such parts as are endangered by the removal bashfulness in itself cannot be admired it completely distrusts its own powers whereas we have seen that a proper reliance on self is at all times highly commendable bashfulness in man is never to be allowed as a good quality but a weakness inasmuch as it suppresses his virtues and hides them from the world when had he a mind to exert himself he might accomplish much good we doubt not but there are many fine intellects passing for naught by reason of their bashfulness modesty is far different from reserve reserve partakes more of the nature of sullen pride it is haughty in demeanour and hath not the sweet retiring disposition of modesty a reserved man is in continual conflict with the social part of his nature and even grudges himself the laugh into which he is sometimes betrayed the modest man does not refuse to perform his part socially his only dread is that others may think he is trying to centre attention on himself the really modest man may be the most social of men the reserved man thinks it is beneath him to mingle with the mass of the people modesty never counsels real merit to conceal itself it never bids one refuse to act when action is necessary and the person is conscious that his powers are adequate for the performance of the task nor when a good deed is to be done should the modest man hesitate to come forward to do it providing he is capable of so doing modesty counsels none to be backwards where duty points the way but modesty strictly forbids that when a good or meritorious action is done that the performer should spread abroad the story of his doings leave that for others to do modesty is the crowning ornament of womanly beauty and the honour of manly powers it alike becomes every age giving new grace to youthful figures and imparting a pleasing virtue to years it softens the asperities of poverty and is a beautiful setting for wealth and fortune it gives additional charms to the possessors of genius and talents or cunningly conceals the want of the same it is the key that unlocks alike the gate to success or the door of love and respect it makes life pleasant to one who exercises the virtue and charities bestowed by its hand are worth far more to the recipient than their mere pecuniary value end of section sixty three modesty section sixty four of the golden gems of life this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. The Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson. Section 64. Love. Life without love. Oh, it would be a world without a sun. Cold as the snow-capped mountain. Dark as myriad nights in one a barren scene without one spot amidst the waste without one blossom of delight of feeling or of taste love in one form or another is the ruling element in life it is the primary source from whence springs all that possesses any real value to man it may be the love of dominion or power which though utterly selfish in its aims and methods has been most marvellously overruled for good in the world's history it may be the love of knowledge 
in the pursuit of which lives have been lost and fortune spent, but grand secrets have been wrung from nature, secrets which have contributed much for the advancement of human interests. But the love grander than any other, before which all the other elements of civilization pale and dwarf to utter insignificance, which is as powerful to-day as in the morning of time, which will continue to rule until time is ended, is that indefinable, indescribable, ever-fresh and beautiful love betwixt man and woman, that love which has the power to tame the savage's heart, which finds man rough, uncultivated and selfish, which leaves him a refined and courteous gentleman, which transforms the timid bashful girl to the woman of matchless power for good. Love is an actual need, an urgent requirement of the heart. Every properly constituted human being who entertains an appreciation of loneliness and wretchedness, and looks forward to happiness and content, feels a necessity of loving. Without it, life is unfinished, and hope is without aim. Nature is defective, and man miserable, nor does he come to comprehend the end and glory of existence, until he has experienced the fullness of a love that actualizes all indefinite cravings and expectations. Love is the great instrument of nature, the bond and cement of society, the spirit and spring of the universe. It is such an affection as can not so properly be said to be in the soul as the soul to be in that. It is the whole nature wrapped up in one desire. Love is the sun of life, most beautiful in the morning and evening, but warmest and steadiest at noon. Love blends young hearts in blissful unity, and for the time so ignores past ties and affections as to make a willing separation of the son from his father's house and the daughter from all the sweet endearments of her childhood's home to go out together and rear for themselves an altar around which shall cluster all the cares and delights the anxieties and sympathies of the family relationship this love if pure unselfish and discreet constitutes the chief usefulness and happiness of human life Without it there would be no organized households, and consequently none of that earnest endeavor for a competence and respectability, which is the mainspring to human efforts, none of those sweet, softening, restraining, and elevating influences of domestic life, which can alone fill the earth with the happy influences of refinement. Love, it has been said, in the common acceptance of the term, is folly, but love in its purity, its loftiness, its unselfishness is not only a consequence but a proof of our moral excellence the sensibility to moral beauty the forgetfulness of self in the admiration engendered by it all prove its claim to a high moral influence it is the triumph of the unselfish over the selfish part of our nature no man and no woman can be regarded as complete in their experience of life until they have been subdued into union with the world through their affections as woman is not woman until she has known love neither is man a complete man both are requisite to each other's completeness love is the weapon which omnipotence reserved to conquer rebel man when all the rest had failed reason he parries fear he answers blow to blow future interests he meets with present pleasure but love, that sun against whose melting beams winter cannot stand, that soft, subduing slumber which brings down the giant, there is not one human soul in a million, not a thousand men in all earth's domain whose earthly hearts are hardened against love. There needs no other proof that happiness is the most wholesome moral atmosphere, and that in which the morality of man is destined ultimately to thrive than the elevation of soul the religious aspirations which attend the first assurance the first sober certainty of true love love is the perpetual melody of humanity it sheds its effulgence upon youth and throws a halo around age it glorifies the present by the light it casts backward and it lightens the future by the gleams sent forward the love which is the outcome of esteem has the most elevating and purifying effect on the character it tends to emancipate one from the slavery of self. 
it is altogether unsorted itself is the only price it inspires gentleness sympathy mutual faith and confidence true love also in a manner elevates the intellect all love renders wise in a degree says the poet browning and the most gifted minds have been the truest lovers great souls make all affections great they elevate and consecrate all true delights love even brings to light qualities before lying dormant and unsuspected it elevates the aspirations expands the soul and stimulates the mental powers it were fitting that the nature of this affection which has such power for good or ill be thoroughly understood and endeavours made to guide it in right channels for love as it is of the first enjoyment so it is frequently of the deepest distress if it is placed upon an unworthy object and the discovery is made too late the heart can never know peace every hour increases the torments of reflection and hope that soothes the severest ills is here turned into deep despair but strange to say though it is one of universal and engrossing interest to humanity the moralist avoids it the educator shuns it and parents taboo it it is considered almost indelicate to refer to love as between the sexes and young persons are left to gather their only notions of it from the impossible love stories that fill the shelves of circulating libraries this strong and absorbing feeling which nature has for wise purposes made so strong in woman that it colors her whole life and history though it may form but an episode in the life of man is usually left to follow its own inclination to grow up for the most part unchecked without any guidance or direction whatever although nature spurns all formal rules and directions in affairs of love though love triumphs over reason resists all persuasion and scorns every dictate of philosophy and though like a fabled tree or plant it may be cut down at night but ere morning it will be found to have sprouted up again in renewed freshness and beauty with its leaves and branches re-expanded to the air and laden with blossoms and fruits still at all events it were best to instil in young minds such views of character as should enable them to discriminate between the true and the false and to accustom them to hold in esteem those qualities of moral purity and integrity without which life is but a scene of folly and misery it may not be possible to teach young people to love wisely but they may at least be guarded by parental advice against the frivolous and despicable passions which so often usurp its name genuine love is founded on esteem and respect you cannot long love one for whom you have not these feelings the most beautiful may be the most admired and caressed but they are not always the most esteemed and loved we discover great beauty in those who are not beautiful if they possess genuine truthfulness simplicity and sincerity no deformity is present where vanity and affectation is absent and we are unconscious of the want of charms in those who have the power of fascinating us by something more real and permanent than external attractions and transitory shows remember that love is dependent upon forms courtesy of etiquette must guard and protect courtesy of heart how many hearts have been lost irrecoverably and how many averted eyes and cold looks have been gained from what seemed perhaps but a trifling negligence of forms love is a tender plant and cannot bear cold neglect it requires kind acts and thoughtful attentions one to the other and thrives at its best only when surrounded by an atmosphere of disinterested courtesy the love of woman is a stronger power and sweeter thing than that of men men and women cannot be judged by the same rules there are many radical differences in their affectional natures man is the creature of interest and ambition his nature leads him forth into the struggle and bustle of the great world love is but the embellishment of his early life or a song piped in the interval of the acts he seeks for fame for fortune for space in the world's thoughts and dominion over his fellow man but a woman's whole life is a history of the affections the heart is her world it is there her ambition strives for empire 
it is there her nature seeks for love and kindness she sends forth her sympathies on adventure she embarks her whole soul in the traffic of affection and if shipwrecked her case is hopeless for it is the bankruptcy of a heart woman's love is stronger than man's because she sacrifices more for every woman is with the food of the heart as with the food of her body it is possible to exist on a very small quantity but this small quantity is an absolute necessity the love of a pure true woman has brightened some of the darkest scenes in world's history it inspires them with courage and incites them to actions utterly foreign to their shrinking dispositions who can estimate the value of a woman's affections gold cannot purchase a gem so precious in our most cheerless moments when disappointments and care crowd round the heart and even the gaunt form of poverty menaces with his skeleton fingers it gleams round the soul like sunlight in dark places it follows the prisoner into the gloomy cell and in the silence of midnight it plays around his heart and in his dreams he folds to his bosom the form of her who loves him still though the world has turned coldly from him love purifies the heart from self it strengthens and ennobles the character gives higher motives and a nobler aim to every action of life and makes both man and woman strong noble and courageous and the power to love truly and devotedly is the noblest gift with which a human being can be endowed but it is a sacred fire and not to be burned before idols disinterested love is beautiful and noble how high will it not rise how many injuries will it not forgive what obstacles will it not overcome and what sacrifices will it not make rather than give up the being upon which it has been once wholly and truthfully fixed it is difficult to know at what moment love begins it is less difficult to know it has begun a thousand messengers betray it to the eye tone act attitude and look the signals upon the countenance the electric telegraph of touch all betray the yielding citadel and there is nothing holier in this life of ours than the first consciousness of love the first fluttering of its silken wings the first rising sound of that wind which is so soon to sweep through the soul to purify or to destroy love is thus a power potent for good but debased and corrupt is as potent for evil if it brings joy it may also conduce to exquisite anguish a disappointment in love is more hard to get over than any other the passion itself so softens and subdues the heart that it disables it from struggling or bearing up against the woes and distresses which befall it the mind meets with other misfortune in her whole strength she stands collected within herself and sustains the shock with all the force which is natural to her but a heart crossed in love has its foundation snapped and immediately sinks under the weight of accidents that are disagreeable to its favourite passion when time brings us to the resting places of life and we all expect them and in some measure attain them when we pause to consider its ways and to study its import we then look back over the waste ground which we have left behind us is it a bright spot to be seen there is it where the star of love has shed its beams is there a plant a flower or any beautiful thing visible is it where the smiles and tears of affection have been spent where some fond eye met our own some endearing heart was clasped to ours take these away and what joy has memory in retrospection or what delight has hope in future prospects the bosom which does not feel love is cold the mind which does not conceive it is dull the philosophy which does not accept it is false and the only true religion in the world has pure reciprocal and undying love for its basis the love that makes memory happy and home beautiful are those which form the sunlight of our earlier years they beam gratefully along the pathway of our mature years and their radiance lingers till the shadows of death darken them altogether end of section sixty four love
Section 65 of The Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. The Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson. Section 65. Courtship. There is an unfortunate tendency in human nature to treat with levity many questions most vitally affecting man's real happiness. Thus, in the question of love, courtship, and marriage, questions than which none could be more important, it is to be deeply regretted that men and women do not more carefully consider the wisdom of their course, do not reflect whether they are guided by the light of calm, sober sense, or are leaving things to impulse. It has been wisely, but sadly, said that years are necessary to cement a friendship, but months, and sometimes weeks, and even days, are sufficient to prepare for that holier state of matrimony. From false regard to public opinion, or as a matter of convenience, or for the mere purpose of securing a home and being settled in life, thousands enter into the most sacred of human relationships with no such feelings as will enable them to bear the burdens which it brings. Love and courtship should be to wedded love what a blossom is to the perfected fruit. The power of this love must be measured not by its intensity, but by its effects, by its beneficence, in bringing into play a higher range of motives, by the facilities it unfolds, by its skill in harmonizing different natures not once in a hundred times do two natures brought side by side harmonize in every part of nothing are people more ignorant than of human nature very rich and fruitful natures are often side by side with very barren ones noble ones with those that are sordid exquisitely sensitive with those coarse and rude this is a consequence to be foreseen from the want of thought evinced by people when about to marry many counsel the young not to expect too much from love this is an evil philosophy however which advises to moderation by undervaluing the possibilities of a true and glorious love happiness in this life depends more upon the capacity of loving than on any other single quality if men lose all the treasures of love it does not prove that the treasure is not to be found but that they have not sought a right in love there are many apartments but not to selfishness sensuality or arrogance will love yield its richest treasures true love is social regeneration it is a revolution ending with a new king and a reconstruction of the soul the way of selfishness is self-seeking that of love self-sacrifice it is this self-sacrificing spirit of love that can alone perpetuate its influence and establish its worth and blessedness true wisdom then will say to the young love but love not blindly justice is represented as blind in order that under no circumstances can she swerve one hair's breadth from the right from personal favor or prejudice but love on the contrary should use his eyes to the fullest extent in order that in days of courtship no stumbling block may be left to become a torment after marriage a moment's consideration will show how utterly repugnant it is to all manly feelings to jest in this matter it is one of the most serious concerns of life your weal or woe and the weal or woe of those who shall come after you and the influence you shall exert upon the world depend in a great measure upon the wisdom and virtue with which you conduct your preparation for marriage all true minds see the manifest impropriety of jesting about the most delicate serious and sacred relation and feeling of human experience the whole tendency of such lightness is to cause the marriage relation to be lightly esteemed and the true aim of courtship to be lost sight of until it is viewed in its true light with that sober earnestness which the subject demands courtship will be nothing else than a grand game of hypocrisy resulting in misery the most deplorable courtships are sweet and dreamy thresholds of unseen temples where half the world has paused in couples talked in whispers under the moonlight passed on but never returned it should be to all but the entrance to scenes of happiness and content but alas 
in the history of many we know that such is not the case we have been but poor observers if we fail to recognize that marriage is not necessarily a blessing it may be the bitterest curse it may sting like an adder and bite like a serpent its bower is as often made of thorns as of roses it blasts as many sunny expectations as it realizes and an illy mated human pair is the most woeful picture of wretchedness that is presented in the book of life and yet such pictures are plenty it becomes all young men and women who are standing where the radiant beams of love are just beginning to gild the pathway before them to endeavor to ascertain with the aid of others experience with calm and careful consideration with an appeal for guidance from on high whether the person he or she proposes to unite their destiny to is the one with whom of all the world they are best adapted to make the journey if as the result of such reflection they are convinced that the choice is wise they may with confidence proceed to take upon themselves the duties and privileges of the marriage relation but if such observation shows that they have heretofore erred as they value their future happiness and the happiness of others let them stop before the vow is said that indissolubly unites their fate with another's marriage should be made a study every youth both male and female should so consider it it is the grand social institution of humanity its laws and relations are of momentous importance to the race should it be entered blindly in total ignorance of what it is what its conditions of happiness are the object of courtship is not to woo it is not to charm gratify or please simply for the present pleasure it is simply for the selection of a life companion one who must bear suffer and enjoy life with us in all of its forms in its frowns as well as smiles joys and sorrows one who will walk pleasantly willingly and confidently by our side through all the intricate and changing vicissitudes incident to mortal life what is to be sought is a companion a congenial spirit one possessed of an interior constitution of soul similar to your own of similar age opinions tastes habits modes of thought and feeling a congenial spirit is one who under any given combination of circumstances would be affected feel and act as we ourselves would it is one who would approve what we approve and condemn what we condemn not for the purpose of agreeing with us but of his or her own free will this is a companion who is already united to us by the ties of spiritual harmony which union it is the object of courtship to discover courtship then is a voyage of discovery or a court of inquiry established by mutual consent of the parties to see wherein and to what extent there is a harmony existing if in all these they honestly and harmoniously agree and find a deep and thrilling pleasure in their agreement find their union of sentiment to give a charm to their social intercourse if now they feel that their hearts are bound as well as their sentiments in a holy unity and that for each other they would live and labor and make every personal sacrifice with gladness and that without each other they know not how to live it is their privilege yes their duty to form a matrimonial alliance the true companion has to be sought for she does not parade herself as store goods she is not fashionable generally she is not rich but oh what a heart she has when you find her so large and pure and womanly when you see it you wonder if those showy things outside were really women courtship is the brilliant scene of the maiden life of a woman it is to her a garden where no weeds mingle with the flowers but all is lovely and beautiful to the sense it is a dish of nightingale served up by moonlight to the mingled music of many tendernesses and gentle whisperings and eagerness that does not outstep the bounds of delicacy courtship is the first turning point in the life of a woman crowded with perils and temptation the rose tints of affection dazzle and bewilder the imagination and while always bearing in mind that life without love is a wilderness 
it should not be overlooked that true affection requires solid support discretion tempers passion and it is precisely this quality which oftener than any other is found to be absent in courtship young persons require wise counsel they should not trust too much to the impulse of the heart or be too easily captivated by a winning exterior in the selection of a wife a pure loving heart and good common sense are many times more valuable than personal beauty or wealth once installed in affections of such a lady you have a life claim on her good offices no sacrifice she can make is too great no adversity so stern that it can shake her firmness or hopefulness such a woman is a helpmeet as the creator designed a wife to be it is an error which has proved fatal to many young lives to marry one whom you consider your inferior in mind or body a wife has the power to make or destroy the home and a weak heart and shallow brain can never have the former effect there can be no such thing as interchange of sentiment where she does not appreciate your highest thoughts can you reveal to her the sacred treasures of mind which lie hidden from the careless gaze of others and be assured of her sympathy can she walk hand in hand with you as her equal honoured above all women is she fit to sit in your household as a shining light respected for her gentle dignity and the wisdom of her management and conversation the quiet reserved girl does not always possess these qualifications neither does the bright gay creature whose presence throws a halo over her surroundings the poor are no more likely to have the proper gifts and trainings than those who never knew a wish ungratified but any woman of noble principles a warm heart and good common sense to guide her can easily reach the standard there is equal danger before the young lady in her choice of a husband young men incline to intemperate habits even but slightly so as they have not sufficient moral stamina to enable them to resist temptation even in its incipient stages and are consequently deficient in self-respect cannot possess that pure uncontaminated feeling which alone capacitates a man for rightly appreciating the tender and loving nature of a true woman it is equally fatal for a woman to marry a man who is her inferior she of necessity descends to his level being his superior in every good sense of the word she cannot have for him that high feeling of regard which every wife should have for her husband lacking that love too soon fades away and only the duties of married life remain its pleasures are all gone what is wanted in both is a true companion not one who possesses wealth not necessarily the possessor of a scholastic education but one who has a pure warm heart and good common sense a true courtship is with all a beautiful sight only the coarse and illiterate can there see aught for ridicule or unseemly jest it is the flowing together of two separate lives that have heretofore been divided now mysteriously brought together to flow on through all time and only god in his infinite wisdom knows how far in the shadowy hereafter end of section sixty five courtship Section 66 of the Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Gems of Life by Emory Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson. Section 66 Marriage the marriage ceremony is one of the most interesting and solemn spectacles that social life presents to see two rational creatures in the glow of youth and hope which invests life in a halo of happiness appear together and acknowledge their preference for each other voluntarily enter into a league of perpetual friendship and amity and call on all to witness the sanctity of their vows awakens deep feeling in the hearts of all beholders 
a holy influence is felt to pervade the place the spirit of the hour is sacramental though mirth may abound before and after the irrevocable formula is spoken yet at that particular point of time there is a shadow on the most laughing lip a moisture in the firmest eye and it may well be so to think of the endearing relations and the important consequences which are to flow from it as the couple walk side by side through life participating in the same joys and sharing the same sorrows two weak frail human natures thus taking upon themselves in the sight of god and man the weighty duties of a new and untried state of existence exerts a solemn influence on all all pictures of human happiness represent sorrow in the background thus the wedding ceremony true it is considered an occasion of great joy but there remains the thought the smile that kindles to ecstasy at their union will at last be quenched in the tears of the survivor man may unite but death only separates if from this proceed some of the deepest joys of life from hence also come not unfrequently the deepest sorrows there is no one thing more lovely in this life more full of the divinest courage than when a young maiden from her past life from her happy childhood when she rambled over every field and moor around her home when a mother anticipated her wants and soothed her little cares when brothers and sisters grew from merry playmates to loving trustful friends from the christmas gatherings and romps the festival in bower or garden from the rooms sanctified by the death of relatives from the holy and secure background of her early life looks out into a dark and unknown future away from all that and yet unterrified undaunted undertakes the journey with a trusting confidence in the one beside her buoyed up with the confidence of requited love she bids a fond and grateful adieu to the life that has passed she turns with excited hopes and joyful anticipations of happiness to what is to come then woe to the man who can blast such hopes who can break the illusions that have won her and destroy the confidence which his love inspired marriage offers the most effective opportunity for spoiling the life of another nobody can debase harass and ruin a woman as her own husband and nobody can do a tithe as much to chill a man's aspiration for good to paralyze his energies as his wife and a man is never irretrievably ruined in his prospects till he marries a bad woman perhaps there is no hour in the life of a man or woman more potential for weal or woe than the marriage hour that is the hour from whence most men can date their success or failure for while nothing is a greater incentive to a man to put forth all his exertions than for the sake of his wife and while her society is the place where he forgets the cares of the world and in its quiet rest finds new courage to take up life's load yet has a wife equal power for ill be a man ever so ambitious energetic or industrious yet with a careless or spendthrift wife his best efforts for success are vain and nothing will sooner discourage a man than a wife too ignorant or too careless to understand appreciate and sympathize with his efforts and for the woman too it is at once the happiest and saddest hour of her life it is the promise of future bliss raised on the death of all present enjoyment she quits her home her parents her companions her occupation her amusements her everything upon which she has hitherto depended for comfort for affection for kindness and for pleasure with the marriage ceremony she enters a new world but it is with her a world from whence she cannot return 
if the man of her choice be an upright pure man with manly traits of character industrious and honest in the majority of cases she is to blame if it be not to her a world of happiness but if she has erred and she finds herself bound for life with one inferior to her or who is enslaved to habit or temper or destitute of manly attributes god help her her future is full of misery a man's moral character is necessarily powerfully influenced by his wife a lower nature will drag him down as a higher one will lift him up the former will deaden his sympathies dissipate his energies and distort his life while the latter by satisfying his affections will strengthen his moral nature and by giving him repose tend to energize his intellect not only so but a woman of high principle will insensibly elevate the aim and purpose of her husband as one of low principles will unconsciously degrade them in the course of life we may see even a weak man display real public virtue because he had by his side a woman of noble character who sustained him in his career and exercised a fortifying influence on his views of public duty while on the contrary all have often witnessed men of grand and generous instincts transformed into vulgar self-seekers by contact with women of narrow natures devoted to an imbecile love of pleasure and from whose minds the grand motive of duty was altogether absent as wives may exercise a great moral influence upon their husbands so on the other hand there are few men strong enough to resist the influence of a lower character in a wife if she does not sustain and elevate what is highest in his nature she will speedily reduce him to her own level and thus a wife may be the making or unmaking of the best of men it is by the regimen of the domestic affections that the heart of man is best composed and regulated the home is the woman's kingdom her state her world where she governs by affection by kindness by the power of gentleness there is nothing which so settles the turbulence of a man's nature as his union in life with a high-minded woman there he finds rest contentment and happiness rest of brain and peace of spirit he will also find in her the best counsellor for her instinctive tact will usually lead him right where his own unaided reason might be apt to go wrong the true wife is a staff to lean upon in times of trial and difficulty and she is never wanting in sympathy and solace when distress occurs or fortune frowns in the time of youth she is a comfort and an ornament of man's life and she remains a faithful helpmate in maturer years when life has ceased to be in anticipation and we live in its realities of all the institutions that affect human weal or woe on earth none is more important than marriage it is the foundation of the great social fabric and conceals within its mystic relations the coiled secrets of the largest proportion of happiness and misery connected with the lot of man marriage to be a blessing must be properly entered it has its fundamental laws which must be obeyed it is not a mysterious wonder-working institution of the almighty which cannot be studied by the common mind but a simple necessity laid in man's social nature which may be read and understood of all men who will investigate that nature the reasons for every enjoyment of the matrimonial life may be understood before entering upon its relations the conditions upon which its joys and advantages are realized may be learned beforehand it should not be entered in blindness but rather in the daylight of a perfect knowledge of its rules and regulations its promises and conditions its laws and privileges so that no uncertainty shall attend its realization 
no unhappy revealments shall follow a knowledge of its reality marriage then should be made a study every youth both male and female should so consider it it is the grand social institution of humanity its laws and relations are of momentous importance to the race shall it be entered blindly in total ignorance of what it is what its conditions of happiness are its relations involve some of the most stern duties and acts of self-denial that men are called upon to perform shall youth enter upon its relations without a knowledge of these duties for all the professions trades and callings in life men and women prepare themselves by previous attention to their principles and duties they study them devote time and money to them every imaginable case of difficulty or trial is considered and duly disposed of according to the general principles of the trade or profession but marriage incomparably the most important and holy relation of life involving the most sacred responsibilities and influences social civil and religious that bear upon men is entered upon in hot haste or blind stupidity by a great majority of youth no young man has any right to ask a young woman to enter the matrimonial bonds with him till he is thoroughly acquainted with the female constitution and character woman loves the strong the resolute and the vigorous in man to these qualities she looks for protection under the shadow of their wings she feels secure but she wants them blended with the tender the sensitive and the lofty in sentiment her companionship her joy she finds in these sentiments where she finds these she pours the full tides of her loving soul and willingly enters the bower of conjugal felicity he who knows not her nature knows not how to gratify and satisfy that nature so woman should know the nature of man the rough world often makes him appear what he is not he has a vein of tenderness below that sternness of his worldly manners which woman should know how to penetrate and bring for her own as well as for his proper enjoyment it is in this strata of tenderness that she will find her true companionship with him and he with her if she is ignorant of his nature she knows not how to supply his wants or answer the calls of that nature thus we see most clearly the necessity of a thorough study of this whole subject by every youth it is ignorance in these matters that causes a great amount of matrimonial infelicity some are disappointed in marriage because they expect too much from it but many more because they do not bring into the co-partnership their fair share of cheerfulness kindness forbearance and common sense their imagination has pictured a condition of things never experienced on this side of heaven and when real life comes with its troubles and cares there is a sudden wakening up as from a dream or they look for something approaching perfection in their chosen companion and discover by experience that the fairest of characters have their weaknesses and yet it is often the very imperfection of human nature rather than its perfections that makes the strongest claims on the forbearance and sympathy of others and in affectionate and sensible natures tends to produce the closest unions marriage is the source from whence originates as from a radiant point the most beautiful glories of life and also the deepest cares talk as we will of marriage it is a real affair it abounds in homely details the joys of the wedding morn are quickly followed by the anxious cares of daily life but if entered understandingly and lived as becomes thoughtful considerate human beings each of whom tries to bear with the other's infirmities and to consider the other's happiness as paramount with their own it then becomes a delightful scene of domestic happiness 
to which all true men and women look forward as the condition of life most consonant to their true happiness. End of section 66